so we welcome you all we will start with this we have uh, two sessions and at the outset i would like to thank dr ilem kumaran and uh, coscon organizing team for giving us a prime slot for ubits and also the three, uh, three hours long session so in session 1 we have keynote lecture followed by case presentation in this uh, first i would like to invite dr somoshila murthy who is the head of konya services uvit is consultant from ld prasad i institute hyderabad she is also a member scientific committee for aos so she will be talking to us on immune mediated sclerosis practical guide in the diagnosis and management over to dr somoshila can you play her rec recordings good evening everybody first of all i would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present at this meeting when we talk about the practical approach of scleritis the important questions to ask is how frequently do you see scleritis in your clinic how confident are you in managing this disease do you have availability of good lab facility for systemic investigations or microbiology and do you have access to rheumatology colleagues with whom you can collaborate luckily scleritis is rare the prevalence is roughly 6 cases per 100000 population however about 10 to 50% of these patients can have underlying systemic associations and another 5 to 20% of cases can be associated with infections so coming to the answer to the first question how frequently do you see scleritis in your clinic if the answer is that you rarely see in that case it's enough for you to be able to diagnose a case of scleritis and also if you can give a differential diagnosis of immune versus infectious scleritis anterior versus a posterior scleritis and if it is anterior be able to differentiate between necrotizing versus a non necrotizing scleritis it is also enough for you to be able to start the patient on oral nsaids topical corticosteroids for the immune mediated variety and in case it is infectious to start the patient on broad spectrum topical and oral antibiotics and then refer the patient to a higher center or to a colleague who regularly deals with these cases however if you often or frequently see these cases or you would like to know the management or you work in a remote place and patient cannot travel then you really need to know about the management of scleritis episcleritis is an innocuous disease where the patient presents with irritation and absence of pain classically there would be blanching of the inflammation or the congestion with phenylephrine should you investigate i think it's not required certainly for the first few episodes i don't you may perform investigation similar to scleritis cases the management involves using topical lenses using low dose steroids or potent topical corticosteroids which can be repeated as and when required coming to various clinical entities in anti in and in scleritis this includes diffuse anterior scleritis in this example you can see a patient with mild to moderate anterior scleritis in the second example of diffuse anterior you see a patient with severe anterior scleritis the picture on your left side lower shows the uveal hue which is uh, which suggests that there were past episodes and this is scleral thinning the right lower picture shows the presence of ischemic necrosis that is just happening at the limbal area necrotizing scleritis is very dramatic and easy to diagnose because of its very severe presentation nodular scleritis also you can see large to small nodules of various sizes as well as various findings within the nodules include focal area of ischemic necrosis scleromalacia perforans is a condition which is associated with rheumatoid arthritis the patient can present with a swan uh, neck kind of deformity of the fingers as you can see in the picture on your left which is of an elderly man or the patient can also have joint effusion as in the picture on your right which is of a female patient and present with scleromalacia perforans in posterior scleritis patients would present with pain on on ocular movements also hardly have any inflammation anteriorly but have blurred vision and examination would show what looks like coronitis even on ffa but when you do a b scan you can see coronal thickening and accumulation of fluid in the subtenon space which is which is a classic sign for Scleritis. 
in necrotizing scleritis with peripheral ulcerative. So how to proceed in case of scleritis? We should know the anatomical diagnosis. The age and gender would help us decide the etiology as well as help us manage. The severity is required to see how aggressive we need to be and what is the systemic component. The classification that was first described by Watson and Harry way back in 1976 still holds good. They had divided immune-mediated scleritis as anterior and posterior and sub further subdivided anterior as necrotizing and non-necrotizing. So if I have a patient who has anterior non-necrotizing diffuse scleritis, these patients are perhaps easier to manage, less likely to have reactivations and may not need very long-term therapy. So when do you do lab investigations? Lab investigations in episcleritis only if it is persist persistent or recurrent in my experience. I always investigate all scleritis and not just the bilateral ones. I always investigate the unilateral necrotizing aggressively and in those patients where I suspect infection. The screening evaluation that we do would include non-specific uh, acute phase reactants as well as more specific investigations such as rheumatoid factor and ANCA antibody testing. Uh, the other investigations such as TPHA and Mantus tests etc. are done to rule out any other infection that the patient may have and all of these are subject to interpretation in the context of the patient that we are seeing. So to divide the investigation, certain investigations are done because you're going to start the patient on immunomodulators. So for fitness, the second group are for reaching an etiological diagnosis which include RA and uh, ANA and ANCA. And also the last group would be the local investigations which are done, for example, ASOCT or uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy, B-scan, microbiological workup in infection, impression cytology in a suspected masquerade, and the rare case of scleral biopsy when we want to do PCR for viruses. So therapy can be put into four or five steps. The first line treatment includes oral NSAIDs and topical corticosteroids. This can be used for the milder cases. Most of the time, we don't see this case in our practice in, in a tertiary institute. So we often see patients who have failed this treatment. So most of the time, we start the patient on second line, which is systemic steroids. And uh, if the patients are the milder variety, they will do well. And we can maintain them on oral NSAIDs or, or occasionally if they have a reactivation with transeptal injection. But if there's poor therapeutic response or we need to use uh, agents for, for a long term, then we need steroid sparing agents such as methotrexate or mycophenolin moftil or azathioprine for long-term therapy for these patients. So in the practice that where I am, we use systemic steroids and methotrexate almost simultaneously in most of the cases. And minor reactivations manage with topical or transeptal. The more aggressive patients with systemic disease, we manage with cyclophosphamide infusions. And of course, the fourth line therapy includes the biological agents and the JAK kinase inhibitors. But in these cases, we collaborate with the rheumatologist. So to conclude, immune-mediated scleritis is rare, but it can be extremely challenging. Uh, the mainstay of treatment for us is oral steroids, but we can't use oral steroids for a very long time, so we have to start the patient upfront on immunomodulator therapy. The newer agents are, are really a boon for both for refractory cases and in those cases where oral steroids or other agents are contraindicated. And it is best to collaborate with the rheumatologist for many of these cases, especially for instituting therapy with uh, biological agents. So once again, I would like to thank the organizers and Dr. Ellen Kumaran for giving me this opportunity to present at this meeting. Thank you. Hepatitis. These patients have an increased association with systemic disease, such as vaginous granulomatosis. This is a patient who has necrotizing scleritis, as you can see there and peripheral ulcerative keratitis. This patient was ANCA positive and turned out to have granulomatosis polyangiitis or vaginous disease. Thank you, Dr. Somashila, for the excellent overview of immune-mediated scleritis. Now, this talk is open for the discussion. Uh, as you all know, immune-mediated scleritis can have as a clue to find out the underlying systemic immune disease most of the times, ophthalmologists can be the first person to see. Whenever we see a patient with PUK or associated scleritis, we need to rule out underlying autoimmune disease. The common ones are rheumatoid arthritis and sometimes life-threatening onca-associated vasculitis also can present, like Dr. Somoshila highlighted in our slides. Usually, we treat them with systemic steroids and systemic immunosuppressive therapy, but if it is life-threatening, 
then biologics like rituximab works well in these cases. So, um, any any other comments from the panelists? Uh, Dr. Ryogesh is here. Uh, Dr. Veda is here. Dr. Manjula, Dr. Vinay, anybody would like to comment? So, Padma, should we put? Uh, um, morning, ma'am. Uh, this is Dr. Vinay. I have a question. Yeah. Dr. Somshila was of the opinion that uh, first episode of episclerate is uh, usually they don't investigate. What is the practice? Uh, uh, like what, what do you and uh, Dr. Padma Malini practice? Do you investigate right away or uh, you still wait for uh, recurrent episodes? Padma, you would like to answer? Yes. Yeah. The first episode of episcleritis, I don't investigate. But in case of scleritis, we look out for thorough systemic evaluation. If systemic examination gives the clue, then we go ahead and investigate and treat the condition. Or most of the times the scleritis is so painful, we have to put the patient on systemic corticosteroids. And before that, we do a screening protocol. I do investigate the case of a scleritis, even if it's the first episode, if it is severe category. So, um, Veda, would you like to comment? Yogesh is also there. So, uh, any of you? Yeah. I think you're on mute, Dr. Veda. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, as Madam said, usually episcleritis, we don't, uh, uh, first episode, we don't uh, uh, evaluate. But if it is a nodular episcleritis, again, we think maybe we have to rule out immune related because. Uh, nodular episcleritis, sometimes there may be an immune related cause. So, even in episcleritis, if it is of nodular type, sometimes it won't settle down with topical steroids alone. So, before starting steroids, we would like to evaluate the patient uh, further. So, if first episode of nodular episcleritis, we do evaluate in detail. Dr. Yogesh, um, Dr. Yogesh wanted to comment. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, mine was mainly a question. Uh, regarding okay. the transeptal steroids uh, or a periocular steroids for scleritis, how uh, often would you use it in your practice? Now? So I, I'd like to take that comment because I've had mixed responses with that. Um, it is a controversy, though there are papers which have suggested to use, you could use this in diffuse scleritis or sectoral scleritis away from the site and all. But I think it is very important to keep in mind what kind of scleritis you're dealing with. And if there is any suspicion of infection, I think you should avoid um, a periocular because this is a general forum. I would kind of want to highlight that aspect the most important. Second thing is many of these refractory scleritis does not settle down with periocular because they have some association with a local, uh, I mean, with a systemic cause. So generally the ones uh, where I have tried local steroid injections are patients with refractory scleritis, like with IgA nephropathy or those kind of, but unfortunately I've not had very great results with them. But uh, I think I would like to stress on the fact that, you know, unless you are sure that it is not an infection. And uh, again, one needs to keep in mind that the sclera is thinned out also. So you need to be very, very careful when even if you're attempting that. I would just like to add one if uh, I think if Padma can permit. See, many of these episcleritis as what Dr. Vinay was mentioning has a lot, you know, these patients have a lot of lid issues also. So I think uh, uh, that is something which is like under, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call estimated kind of in um, patients with uveitis. And generally these kind of lid hygiene, mebomian gland diseases also can cause that kind of episcleritis, which keeps coming back again and again. So I think when we're trying to investigate, one needs to even look at the lid uh, part. And if you feel that the lid issue is quite significant, then maybe we could wait uh, control the lid thing and then kind of investigate accordingly. But in my practice, if it is a, a severe episcleritis, like it is just not a very small epi or a very mild episcleritis, if it is a significant episcleritis, I would still investigate because many of these cases start off with episcleritis and then go in for scleritis. So 
for me, I think uh, investigations first or recurrent episodes will not make a difference. I think it also depends on the severity of inflammation which you're seeing. Thank you. Yes. Ask Edge of clean steroids like Kalpana said it's contraindicated in infective steroiditis and it's useful. You can give it in anterior steroiditis and usually it's away from the site of the inflammation. That is more important, not at the site of the inflammation we give. And the second thing, like IgA nephropathy with steroiditis, they respond very well to periocular steroids because of the fibrosis, whatever the systemic drug we give, it doesn't reach the site. So in that situation, I also find it useful to give repeated periocular steroid in injections in a case of a steroiditis associated with IgA nephropathy. I said, Padma, I have my series actually, uh, unfortunately did not respond to um, it very refractory these cases were. So I still have a lot of apprehensions with uh, um, periocular even in systemic so conditions. In addition but, to know, the systemic, yeah, we give yeah. them the periocular. They have to take Correct. systemic immunosuppressive therapy. That's no shortcuts. But Correct. whenever they have a flare-up and acute exacerbation, that time they respond to local steroid. That is a stopgap. It's not the solution to control the inflammation in these cases. And one more, in addition to the lead margin infection, the viral scleritis. So that is also like, you know, underdiagnosed patient might have had episodes sometimes or herpetic infections. They end up getting recurrent inflammation. That is also one of the group of infective scleritis we see commonly in our practice. So can we go can on to the next talk? Next, yeah. So the next keynote will be uh, on non-malignant masquerades. And this is given by uh, Dr. Rohan Chabla, who is uh, very, uh, who is an expert in the field of retina and uveitis, and he's from RP Center, uh, Delhi. Uh, can we have his uh, video, please? Good morning. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Karnataka Ophthalmology Society and especially Dr. Elin for giving me this opportunity. So my topic is non-malignant masquerades. So whenever we talk of uveitis and whenever we assess a patient with uveitis, the first objective is to confirm whether the patient is actually having inflammation in the eye. Is it actually uveitis or is it something which is mimicking, mimicking uveitis? So they can be malignant mimickers and there can be non-malignant mimickers. So I would be talking more about the non-malignant things which may look like uveitis. There are no financial disclosures. So let's go from anterior to the posterior segment. So talking about what mimics anterior uveitis. Sometimes you can have a patient with an acute red eye with corneal edema and high pressures and with probably some cells which you might mistake for anterior uveitis with high pressure. But if you look carefully and you make a slit and see the endothelium, if you find a lot of pigment dispersion there, not much of KPs, it might actually be a case of pigment dispersion syndrome with glaucoma. So it may not be anterior uveitis at all. So if you do a gonioscopy, you might find a heavily pigmented angle over there. And in some cases, you might find these Krukenberg spindle-like deposits in the center in the pupil. On uh, UBM, the patients would have a plateau sort of iris, and this confirms that it is a more of a pigment dispersion syndrome. So uh, some of these cases now can also be confused with the recently identified entity called BADI, or where we say bilateral acute depigmentation of iris. Now in those cases also, the eye would have more of pigment in the anterior chamber, but it would be more red and painful and more symptomatic and more acute than a pigment dispersion syndrome. So these have minimum differences, but it is important to differentiate between these conditions. Let us go a little behind. So if we see this hazy sort of vitreous, it may not always be vitritis and intermediate uveitis. You should also carefully look behind the lens. And if you find something like this, this is called pseudopodia lentis. Uh, here I've shown it more better. 
so these pseudopodial entities are more characteristic of something called vitreous amyloidosis so again you see these fibril sort of attachments to the back of the lens and vitreous haze but to do an oct there is lack of cme and if you take history of these patients you might find other systemic uh, dis defects as well as you might find history of early deaths in the family so these are actually cases of vitreous amyloidosis which may mimic intermediate uveitis another mimic is lymphoma but since we are dealing with non malignant i am not talking about that now suppose you see a patient like this with some pigmented kps and maybe some reaction you may want to diagnose it as anterior uveitis if you fail to see the posterior segment but when you dilate and see you might actually find that you are missing a retinal detachment because sometimes these detachments might also be associated with some amount of uveitis so in all cases of uveitis or suspected uveitis it is important to properly assess the posterior segment also now what do you make out of this you see you see a lot of disc edema you see these cotton wool like spots and hard exudates and you might uh miss make a diagnosis of retinitis also over here but if this patient actually only had grade 4 hypertensive retinopathy so if you have such severe uh disc edema with other manifestations of hypertensive retinopathy the first thing to be done is to check a bp and this patient would probably not have much of inflammation in the form of anterior chamber cells so all we did when this patient was control the blood pressure and you see after uh, about a month or so significant resolution of these changes but since this patient also might have had hypertensive choroidopathy we see these pigmentary changes over here and this patient actually did uh, improve to i think 612 in the right eye and about 6 by 36 in the left eye so this is something which can be confused with florid sort of retinitis so you can even have exudative detachments in this in hypertensive retinopathy because of this choroidopathy and sometimes these can be confused with vkh and if you pump these patient with steroids you would rather worsen the hypertensive retinopathy okay. now in this patient you see this pigmented scar here and some pigmentary mottling in the other eye so these ill defined pigmentary sort of lesions also sometimes make people make a diagnosis of healed choroiditis or partially active choroiditis but all of them are not choroiditis all pigment and the posterior pole is not choroiditis so if you do an angiography you see that these are mottled pigment tracts which are going towards the inferior fundus so this is actually a case of chronic central serous retinopathy with pigmentary mottling there is no leakage other than that in the fundus even the discs are absolutely normal and so this is not a case of uveitis at all but case of chronic csr another pigmented lesion here heavily pigmented lesion with well defined borders and some hemorrhages on it so this is also not a choroiditis patch but this is something called congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium you see the retina and the choroid all around it is very silent and very healthy so any active inflammation would not have a very uniform border it would have some merging diffuse borders which would be suggestive of spreading activity now here in this case actually these hemorrhages were due to a small branch retinal vein occlusion over it and we have published this case but this is again not uveitis another deeply pigmented lesion with borders which are again not that well defined but if you see carefully again the surrounding uh, retina and choroid appear absolutely healthy and since this lesion is deep deeper to the vessels so this is actually a choroidal nevus again don't confuse it with choroiditis this patient some uh, developed a csr like picture over the choroidal nevus you see these pinpoint leaks and this is actually well described and sometimes some people also say that this might be an indication that this lesion is turning malignant but we just treated this patient with photodynamic therapy and it settled down so another condition with coarse pigmentation in the retina and these fibrotic bands this is a basically a case again of a self settled retinal detachment and nothing to do with choroiditis 
So in this patient, you see both eyes symmetrical sort of lesions where there is appears to be pigment epithelial and atrophy of the choroidal tissue also. You see these large choroidal vessels. So again, very papillary and are spreading around the arcades, but the high symmetry between the two eyes, the lack of um, the uh, lack of media haze. That means the media is absolutely clear, and probably the age of the patient would again point towards a non-inflammatory etiology. And you see the OCT again; the fovea is normal, and or you the atrophic patches again can be highlighted with the retinal pigment epithelium as well as the choroidal tissue is atrophied. So this is again a dystrophy, so an annular choroidal dystrophy and not uveitis. So uh, this patient which has this yellowish white large lesion at the posterior pole, some of these are referred to us as tuberculomas, but all choroidal yellowish lesions are not granulomas or tuberculomas. So if you do an OCT scan, you see that it has caused secondary disruption in the retina, a lot of fluid and distortion of the retinal architecture. But if you see what is happening to the choroid, it is not pushing the choroid and the retina up, but it is actually pushing the choroid and the sclera behind. So this whole lesion is in the posterior part of the choroid with some lamellar horizontal lines, which is actually bone. And if this calcium deposit in this lesion can be confirmed on ultrasound B scan, which gives a very high spike. So this is actually a case of choroidal osteoma. So although we do not have much treatment for it, but we should not confuse it with the tubercloma and start treating it with anti-tubercular therapy. So there can be other choroidal masses as well, other than tuberculomas and granulomas. Now this is a case of choroiditis which has mostly healed because of the pigmentation that you see all here. But the patient came with a recent fall in vision. But we still cannot appreciate an active choroiditis patch. So what is happening? If you see carefully, there appears to be some amount of bleed here. So a choroiditis patient, sometimes they come to you again with a non-inflammatory entity. If we do an OCTA scan through this, we find we can easily identify this choroidal neovascular membrane. So at this juncture, the patient does not have active uveitis, but the patient has a secondary choroidal neovascularization, which is a consequence of the past healed uveitis. So you have to differentiate between a secondary CNV and something which is not active choroiditis. Now here again, in this patient, the peripapillary area shows this yellowish region, which um, you could say might be a patch of active choroiditis, but I have been following up this patient, so I know that this patch is sort of a healed one. But with fresh symptoms, I again ordered a OCTA scan and I, we find that this also is developing some choroidal neovascular tissue. So these are secondary choroidal neovascular membranes and not active choroiditis. Now again, a deep yellowish creamy patch would make one think that it is uveitis. But this is again a silent eye, no vitreous inflammation, no cells in the anterior chamber, disc is normal. So this is another entity which is associated with the yellowish patch and which is not uveitis. It is actually central serous retinopathy with fibrin deposition. So you will find the deposition there on the OCT and the subtle pigment epithelial detachment and sometimes subretinal fluid. But again, this is not uveitis and this is not to be treated with steroids. Rather, steroids need to be avoided here. In other similar case here, you see this yellowish patch with some striations and uh, there is a shallow exudative detachment actually over here. So again, this is not choroiditis. Please do not treat with steroids. If you do a fluorescein angiography, you can see these mushroom shaped leaks. This is again case of central serous retinopathy with fibrin deposition. It can sometimes be even very severe and also have exudative detachments associated with it. But the absence of other signs of inflammation in the eye would should always make you think whether it is actually choroiditis or something else. Now, if you see this case, you see multiple pockets of fluid and some yellowish deposition in the deep uh, retina or the choroidal level. Now, is this uveitis? Well, if you see the disc here, it is a bit hyperemic. If you see the OCT, you see these multiple dots and this fluid, which is not very clear. 
and a lot of leak on chromatin angiography. So yes, or uh, and, and if you do an ICG, the patches of active choroiditis actually become hypo black where the lymphocytes have infiltrated. So yes, this is a case of uh, active inflammation. This is VKH and this is not CSR as the cases which I was showing you earlier. So pockets of fluid can be both CSR as well as VKH and depending on whether there are other signs of inflammation in the eye, whether the disc is inflamed and your angiographic imaging features, you can distinguish between these two entities. So just to summarize, uh, for anterior uveitis, there is an entity called pigment dispersion syndrome which may mimic it and you need to differentiate it from that. For intermediate uveitis, vitreous and sometimes even old cases of vitreous hemorrhage, you might uh, misdiagnose as having vitreitis. So you have to be careful there also. And posterior uveitis, you may have simple conditions like a retinal detachment, which you may fail to see if you fail to examine the posterior segment. And there may be various pigmentary lesions, which you can confuse with choroiditis, such as congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium, dystrophies, nevi, self-settled detachment, and pigment tracts. And there are masses such as osteomas, which need to be differentiated from granulomas and exudative lesions such as hypertensive retinopathy and central serous scurioretinopathy, which again need to be differentiated from exudative uh, uveitic conditions such as VKH. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohan, for such an extensive coverage of non-malignant masquerades. Um, uh, he is not there uh, right now, but I would like to invite comments from our um, other speakers, if they would like to add more to this list of uh, uh, conditions. Uh, Apurva, uh, uh, would you like to comment? Dr. Apurva, Dr. Manjula. Yes, ma'am. I had uh, come across a patient uh, who is... Uh, in fact, it was hypertensive retinopathy, but it was diagnosed as VKH and was sent to me. There were choroidal undulations, the auto fluid. When I checked the PP, BP was very high. So he was started on steroids. I stopped it and it resolved very well with the hypertension, antihypertensive medications. This is one. And second one, CSR had come with, it, it appeared as if it's a VKH. It was like a lot of choroidal undulations, a lot of subretinal fluid. So I had this atypical CSCRs where it, like, you know, you get confused with VKH, but there are no other signs of inflammation supported in the FA. FA is very diagnostic. And madam, I have a doubt. In the last case, when you saw that FA showed early hypo with late staining, would you put it as VKH or APMPP? <laughs> you, we can get uh, hypofluorescence in the early cases. Need not be pinpoint hypofluorescence present in all cases. But the... Uh, other findings and the OCT features looks like a VKH. Um, the, I think what adds more to the confusion is in the patient with inflammation, they land up with a CSR. You know, the, those are real diagnostic dilemmas. And I think we should trust our clinical acumen and the imaging modalities probably to go in. Uh, I thought probably we could also add uh, retinitis pigmentosa. I mean, we do see cases with retinitis pigmentosa and that comes with vague inflammations. Um, I thought that was another, uh, I mean, something which is usually missed and sent to the UVA clinic for, uh, you know, but uh, inflammation, treating inflammation. And neurofibromatosis, sometimes these leashed nodules, sometimes they sit on the iris and uh, they can be sent as iris granulomas. So I think this is something more we could add into our list of uh, huge list of non-malignant masquerades. But I would really agree with Dr. Rohan in terms of malignant hypertension and CSR, which are so commonly mistaken for uveitic entities and the treatment is totally different. So um, I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and a very in informative presentation for all of us. Most of the times, the system biomacrospic examination of anterior vitreal cells will give us a clue. For example, the tobacco-dustine, the pigmented cells in a case of a retinal detachment, we'll get it. And also, like, you know, hamelidosis and other conditions, we'll be seeing the large comes of cells. And lymphoma also, we will see large morphologies, different and the slightly larger shaped cells. 
So this kind scan help us and also the pigment uh, red cells in addition to the RP, we also come across in other retinal dystrophies that again, definitely one of the differential diagnosis for non-malignant masquerades. So one Even more entity I think which can be added, it may be a rare entity uh, following uh, quinolones use. It could be in the form of a systemic or topical moxifloxacin can cause depigmentation of the iris has been described as a bilateral acute depigmentation of the iris or bilateral acute transillumination of the iris defects, call it as a bite. These two conditions can be triggered by quinolones. Once we stop the quinolones and they do better in the sense they take progressive depigmentations and finally they settle down. In addition to the viral, the quinolone use can be considered. In these situations, we have to stop the quinolones use and the steroids are not indicated in this entity. I think Vinay, probably if you want to add, uh, vitreous hemorrhage also sometimes, you know, they yes. can, um, old vitreous hemorrhages, sometimes it looks like um, old membranes or so. So that is again another important DD. I mean, these are common ones which are usually mistaken for um, inflammations. Uh, sometimes posterior vitreous detachment can also be confusing yeah. actually. We may confuse it with uh, vitreous as uh, vitreitis uh, because uh, occasionally we see some cells, we do see some cells in the vitreous cavity in posterior vitreous detachment and especially in high myopes where the vitreous will be we need to be cautious in diagnosing uh, and there will be associated RP changes which, may, which will mimic old uh, uh, paraditis also. So that I felt uh, can mimic uh, UVATS. Um, Ma'am, sometimes you can be syndrome. Sorry. Yeah, pseudo exfoliation. In PXF, yes. yeah, pseudo exfoliation when they right. dilated, the PXF material and the pigments get released. Can you unmute so yourself? Unmute the video. You can switch on your video. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in PXF syndrome, sometimes uh, when the PXF material and the pigments get released from general units, they'll say patient posted for surgery, please give clearance because there is anterior vitreous uh, uveitis. So they always get confused with the flare and the pigments and they think it's an active uh, inflammation. So we have seen in few cases where they think it's an anterior uveitis. And even the PXF, sometimes when it is stuck on the cornea, it looks like uh, depigmented old uh, KPs. So sometimes they think it's an old KP or a, like older resolved uveitis and get referred to Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Now we'll move on to the interesting <laughs> part of the session. That is a case presentation. We'll start with the uh, first case presentation by Dr. Yogesh Kamat. He's a consultant from Manipal Hospital. And he'll be presenting a challenging case of hypopion uveitis. Over to Dr. Yogesh. Good morning. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present uh, a challenging case today. So I'll be presenting a case of hypopoyon uveitis, which posed a challenge in our clinical diagnosis. So this patient was a 65-year-old lady, a farmer, who presented with a photophobia and pain in the right eye with redness since two weeks. She had no relief with topical antibiotics and had decreased vision since six months in that eye. She was not a diabetic and had no other systemic illnesses or cardiac illness. She had a history of trauma, which was very vague, which she says uh, embers of firewood fell into her face, uh, but she wiped it off immediately and there was no bleeding from the eye. The other eye was normal with the 6-9 vision. On examination in the right eye, her vision was only hand movements and she had a very fluid hypopion. It was a very striking, uh, uh, striking changing its position with uh, uh, position of the head. And apart from that, her intraocular pressure was only 12 millimeters of mercury. And when we searched for a specific evidence of trauma, there was no evidence of corneal, scleral or conjunctival tear which was seen. As there was no view of the fundus, a B scan which was done showed a hyperechoic vitreous with membranes. 
So at this point, we made a diagnosis of a right eye acute panuveitis, uh, which was non-granulomatous in nature, in a farmer with a history of trivial injury to the eye, which he had had two weeks earlier. So at this point, the differential diagnosis would have been a traumatic endophthalmitis. However, there was no entry wound seen. It could have been endogenous endophthalmitis. However, there was no systemic illness. Could it have been leptospira uveitis? But she denied any history of fever or myalgia. Immunological causes which she should not have missed or ruled out include uh, Bechet's disease, which is very commonly seen with the hypopion, classically described with the hypopion, uh, hypopion uh, uveitis. But she denied any history of joint pain or oral ulcers. There was a possibility of HLA B27 related uveitis, but she denied any skin, joint, inflammatory symptoms, or genital urinary or gastrointestinal symptoms. So at this point, I would want to investigate and uh, I would have wanted to ask for an antechamber tap, probably for PCR analysis and endogenous endothermitis. I would have wanted to rule out by doing a blood culture, leptospira uveitis using a leptomat. Bechet's, if I could get HLA-B51, would have been good. And later on, if the view improved, I would have probably wanted an FFA. And of course, for HLA-B27, uh, I would have wanted the HLA-B27 results itself. This is apart from the routine investigations, such as complete blood picture, ESR, uh, liver and renal function tests, which we would need for monitoring the treatment, a rheumatoid factor and an ANA. We had to rule out tuberculosis. We had to rule out masquerades, so we might have asked for peripheral smear and HIV and TPHA in case she was immunocompromised and we didn't know it. However, the patient, when we gave a list of investigations like this, uh, was uh, turned out to be very financially poor and she could not afford any of them and was reluctant. At this point, we thought we had to do with the resources which are available. And so when we went back to her history, something which was striking was a decreased vision in six months with the other eye being normal. So when we asked her more about this, six month history of loss of vision in the right eye, in the eye which has now got a hypopion uveitis. She revealed that this decrease in vision had started following an injury with a wooden stick six months earlier. And she had visited our hospital also about a month after that. Uh, and she was evaluated here. And so since we thought we'd get some clue from that, we went back to our medical records. And when we searched her photograph, which was there, which was taken, we found that it was the patient was an aphatic patient and she had a posterior dislocation of the lens. Now, this gave us a very a breath of relief because we didn't now change the whole outlook of our condition here. And uh, since the cataract, it, the lens was also cataractous, it went more in favor of a lens induced uveitis. In any case, uh, we had to treat the patient. So after a few days of, or I think around a week of uh, getting all the clearances from the insurance, uh, she, we, she agreed for the surgery and we had to take her up for surgery. So after the initial anterior segment serial tunnel, which was made, uh, she underwent a vitrectomy, uh, courtesy uh, Dr. Shailaja, uh, my vitreoretinal colleague. And then we had to, after a big um, struggle of removing the lens, which kept falling down and kept picking it up, uh, we finally brought it into the AC and then we could deliver it with the Vectis. And then there was a layer of very dense exudates which had formed over the iris, which we could literally peel off. And in view of this intense inflammation, we left the patient aphakic and we did not implant a intraocular lens at that point. We probably would like to do it later. So on presentation, the hypopion uveitis had improved and uh, thereafter she was just kept on topical steroids and systemic steroids. And with that, she improved considerably and with a clear, clear view of the fundus when we saw her two weeks post-op. Histopathology of the section uh, of the material which was sent was suggestive of lens matter, but the culture was negative for either bacteria or fungus. So the diagnosis which was finally made was a lens-induced uveitis or a phacolytic uveitis. Now, lens-induced uveitis is rarely reported and its occurrence is known to uh, be after a few days of the insult or maybe even years after the insult. Uh, it is more commonly seen in females and it is somewhat due to the breakdown of a T cell tolerance to the lens protein. Uh, earlier, the term phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis and phacotoxic uveitis were used. Nowadays, if the capsule is ruptured, we use the term phacogenic or phacoantigenic uveitis. And if there is an intact capsule as it was there in our case, we call it phacolytic uveitis. The treatment is of course the surgical removal of the lens along with the steroids and anti-glaucoma medications if the pressures are high. 
if left untreated or in even if it is uh, treatment is delayed there is a possibility of neovascularization and a proliferative vitreo retinopathy and there may even be a high femur associated with the hypopion due to the intense inflammation it can also mimic a chronic endophthalmitis and uh, usually can though we expect because of lens matter being there we expect a granulomatous uveitis here we can also see non granulomatous type of uveitis and then that explains why the hypopion was moving with the change in position of the head so i would like to thank uh, coscon uh, the organizers of coscon once again uh, for giving me this opportunity and now i think the case is open for discussion thank you thank you dr priyakesh for presenting the most challenging case now this case is open for discussion i would just like to ask dr yogesh one thing uh, i mean it's yes, so nicely highlighted the importance of history and the um, need to look at all the past records with your case and yes. uh, uh, was a b scan done in this i mean did this was already dislocated is it the lens in the vitreous uh, yes ma'am the b scan uh, was when we did the b scan actually i was not there uh, it was done in a routine way and uh, when they did the b scan a uh, patient coming with a history of trauma with a pain in the eye and a b scan showing a lot of vitreous echoes uh, they did i would have when i saw it uh, subsequently i had always asked what about the ubm had we done the ubm we would have probably picked it up and the other thing is the lens which was dislocated was uh, just stuck to the back of the iris almost it was in the uh, just uh, behind the iris so the b scan routine b scan could not pick it up so probably if we had a ubm uh, then probably it could have been more uh, or anti segment oct we would have probably got some more idea uh, and it would have been clear from the beginning but what i wanted to highlight in this case was uh, uh, even without any investigation because uh, the patient was very poor and she was uh, uh, when she said, said that you know we can still instead of mistaking every hypopion uveitis for a Uh, uh, for a uh, something more complicated, we can always uh, come to a conclusion with the proper uh, history. Uh, that is what I wanted to highlight. Uh, I would just like to ask, uh, Doctor Veda, like probably you would be seeing a lot of such cases in your community, you know, uh, settings. Mm -hmm. So how do you? Yes, handle, do you see? We do get a very commonly. That's what I was thinking because it is rare, but still, at least here we get a lot of cases. Sometimes we have one eye mature cataract and other eye lens induced uveitis. The two with backlog of COVID, we are getting quite a few cases. The only thing we noticed was like though the book says remove the lens, that is the cause. The post-operative period is very bad when we straight away go ahead and uh, remove the lens. So we try to treat them for a week at least with topical and oral steroids. bring down the inflammation then go ahead we give it to the surgeon like if he thinks he can place an iol there if he feels that uh, intraoperatively it's fine to place an iol we allow them to place a iol otherwise we leave them a fake and as a secondary procedure we uh, place the iol uh, the other thing is when inflammation is very severe uh, the bleeding and the intraoperative part becomes very difficult for the surgeon so we wait for one to two weeks your patient keeps pushing us that like uh they want a surgery uh, again sometimes there will be associated glaucoma also again the glaucoma surgeon also wants to take up the patient for surgery so but at least we wait for a week to inflammation to come down and then we go ahead with surgery usually when inflammation is well controlled they get a good post operative uh, vision so the, do these patients require immunomodulation apart from steroids no ma'am usually so, no, like usually after the lens is removed if it is washed well like all the lens material is washed well a short course of steroid will help and uh, other thing i wanted to add was as, uh, as sir said sometimes the nucleus will be just behind the iris if a patient cannot afford ubm if you uh, do a ultrasound with a water bath like they keep a, a like water bath and do they can pick up the lens just behind the iris that we ask for sometimes when we think and the patient can't afford for a ubm we ask the ultrasound person to do the repeat the ultrasound with a water bath so that they can pick it up just behind the iris nicely you highlighted the differential diagnosis and also brought the infective uveitis as one of the first differential diagnosis compared to the immune mediated uveitis in your case had the fibroid injury history of trauma always we tend to think of an infective etiology as a past and also the clinical picture based on the first presentation the lens induced was not obvious and when we went back and saw the old record in that we could make out the dislocated lens that gave the clue 
So that was very nice and well documented, important history and the differential diagnosis. And also would like to ask Leptomat, do you get it? Where do you get it? And how do you do it? Leptospirosis is commonest. Uh, in, yes, in thank you. Country, but Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, no, the leptomat, actually, uh, there is a student project going on. We don't have it routinely here, but there's a PhD yes. student in the microbiology who is doing leptomat now for the last two years. So I've been fortunate to get leptomat done through him. So, but otherwise, leptomat is not routinely available. It's very difficult. In Arvind, we had the, uh, uh, Dr. Ratinam used to have it, but uh, okay. other places, very difficult to get a le leptomat. How far the ELISA is significant? Because most of the places when you don't have an access, we do the ELISA. Uh, we do use a lepto IgM, uh, but uh, or a ELISA, but uh, according to even I spoke to Dr. Ratinam also, uh, not very reliable. Matt would be uh, confirmatory. I would just like to ask a question because since this question of lepto has come up, you know, many of these sometimes we see all these idiopathic uh, hypopion related uveitis. And there is an issue for us in terms of getting investigations for these cases in terms of lepto. Uh, do you need to, I mean, do you have, uh, at least those who have seen probably Dr. Veda, Dr. Yogi, you have seen cases of lepto, you know, when you were Ar Arvind. Uh, does a previous, I mean, do all of them have a previous hepatocellular insult? Like, do they have liver enzymes altered or they just come with hypopion and, uh, I mean, there is no other way of us trying to kind of, narrow our diagnosis to lepto. Veda, I think you're it's on mute. It's usually not everybody has a, a hepatorenal function. Usually All they right. give history of fever with joint pain. Sometimes all we have is history of contact with cattle or rats. Uh, very few patients, very few, like maybe in a year, two or three patients have uh, like such a bad uh, clinic systemic history. Sometimes we will be like, madam will be the first person to pick up and say, okay, this patient has uh, systemic leptospirosis and send the patient for a clinical uh, systemic evaluation. Uh, but that's like two, three patients in a year. Rest of them, it's more like a subclinical fever or a history of contact with uh, a cattle, diseased cattle or a history of rat. Uh, sometimes they even say rat bite and all those things. But otherwise, not every patient gives uh, systemic proper systemic history. It's only the clinical picture. And as Sir said, we also had a uh, uh, AMRF project with leptomat. So we were getting leptomat even we don't have leptomat now. So we, it's very difficult to maintain the strain. Yes, yes. So we also outsource only we don't have leptomat right now. Thank you. Ma'am, one more thing I wanted to add, uh, uh, Dr. Kalpana, this is regarding the unseasonal rains in Karnataka now which are there. So uh, last year and uh, earlier, uh, leptomat I've seen, most of our people, though they were agriculturists, they never had this uh, leptospira, I think, earlier. But nowadays, with these unseasonal rains, it's a lot of flooding. Bangalore, I think there must be, we are under-reporting uh, leptospira. I think there will be leptospira a lot. We have rats everywhere. And uh, so leptospira is common I in the veterinary. you <laughs> this question, because we're seeing a lot of idiopathic and we really don't, it doesn't really fit into any, you know, of what we actually do. One more so thing that I remember, yes ma'am, one more thing which I remember which madam says is a very rapid onset of cataract. So cataract yeah, develops very right. fast in very them. Fast. Uh, the other thing is a non-granulomatous pan with only, it, it mimics uh, endogenous, endogenous endothermitis. Okay. So something like a, a subclinical endogenous endothermitis sort of a picture, we have to probably think of lepto. Lepto. Thank you, thank you. And also the thank partially you. absorbed lens, also we see just cataract this lens. Yes, sir. So um, if there are no further questions, we will move on to the next case. And it, we had a wonderful discussion, actually. I've learned a lot in this, uh, with this case. So we'll move on to Dr. Vinay's video um, on an interesting case of a choroidal nodule. I think this is a wrong, yeah. I think it's... Uh... As per the order, I think Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, Manjula. I'm sorry, sorry. It's the Dr. Next... Manjula. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's yeah. Dr. Manjula's case. Yeah. No problem, yeah. madam. Good morning. Yeah, but sorry, can I'm... I share my slides? Can... Just a minute. We'll introduce you, Dr. Manjula. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Dr. Manjula, Manjula is a UVITS and retina consultant for Retina Institute of Karnataka, Bangalore. And she's going to present an interesting case with the title of It Becomes Great Responsibility. To Dr. Manjula, we will take up Dr. Uh, can, uh... Can I request them to stop sharing so that I can share? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, are my slides visible, ma'am? 
Yes, Manjula. Yeah, can I go ahead? Yes. Yeah, good morning. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank KOS and Kalpa, Kalpana Ma'am and Padma Ma'am for giving me an opportunity. I'll be presenting a case of a 78-year-old gentleman who presented to us with blurring of vision in the left eye of eight months duration. He gives history of no vision in the right eye since past six years. He's a known hypertensive, well-controlled with treatment. He's a non-diabetic. He's undergone bypass surgery six years back and he's been stable throughout. Looking back at his treatment history, he was diagnosed elsewhere as having left eye CRVO with macular edema, for which he received intravitreal ranibizumab in the beginning, and then he was shifted to dex implant. He has received a total of five implants in the past one and a half years, and the last implant being in September 2021, just one month prior to presenting to us. In between, he has undergone a cataract surgery also for the same eye. On presentation, the best corrected visual acuity in the left eye is 3 by 60. I'm not going to talk about the right eye because it's a prethysical eye. The left eye anterior chamber showed two plus cells. The vitreous also showed presence of two plus cells. There was a mild vitreous haze and dex implant was visualized in the vitreous cavity. On fundus examination, the left eye disc appeared slightly pale. The vessels appeared slightly tortuous. There were blotchy hemorrhages, which are more confluent in the posterior pole, but are also seen in all the four quadrants. And in the last picture, you can see the dex implant in the vitreous cavity. But what was surprising was the presence of a large granular retinitis patch in the supranasal periphery, which was extending, sorry, extending almost three clock hours. The OCT through the macula at that time on presentation showed near normal foveal contour with mild parafoveal hyperreflectivity corresponding to the hemorrhages and a mild parafoveal cystoid edema. With a provisional diagnosis of viral retinitis, uh, he was investigated systemically also. There was no evidence of any infection with MAN2 being negative, X-ray normal, VDRL was non-reactive, he was immunocompetent, peripheral blood smear was normal, and serum ACE levels were normal. He underwent ACTAP for PCR of viral profile, which was positive for cytomegalovirus and negative for HSV and VZV. The plan was to give intravitreal gansacovir 2 mg in 0.1 ml twice weekly as the induction phase for two weeks, followed by a maintenance phase of once a week injection. But at this point, my only question was the implant being there, is it okay? Because we know that steroids can impair the resolution of retinitis, active retinitis. When I looked through the literature, it didn't help me much, probably because the, that there are not reports, many reports available. I decided to observe for three points. The first point, there were no randomized control trial to prove the point of explantation of the ozodex. The second, the retinitis patch was in the periphery, not in the macula. Third, we might require steroids during the management of retinitis to combat the inflammation. All these points made me, uh, made, made me to observe the implant as of now. So as per the plan, I started him on intravitreal gansaclovir, two milligram in 0.1 ml twice weekly. After one week, what I could see is the vision being stable and the retinitis patch started showing regression. The resolution continued even after 10 days with good resolution of the retinitis patch. The AC reaction had also come down. After two weeks of induction, I switched on to maintenance phase of once a week injection. I also added oral valag and cyclovir 450 milligram twice daily. With this, both systemic and topical, uh, local intravitreal uh, and antibiotics, antivirals, at one month, the retinitis patch showed significant resolution. And then when I saw him at six weeks, the BCVI had slightly improved to six by 60. AC was quiet, which is, was clear. And I was happy with the resolution. It was almost 90% resolution of the retinitis patch. So to summarize whatever I've covered now, he's an elderly gentleman, immunocompetent, non-diabetic, status post multiple injections of dex implants for CRVO with recurrent macular edema over the post one and a half to two years, developed semi retinitis during the course of treatment. So when I looked into the incidence, because this is the first I encountered in an immunocompetent and post-ex implant, they have reported viral retinitis. There are a few reports of viral retinitis as after any local type of steroid, whether peri or, peri or, uh, or ocular or intravitreal or subconjunctival, even sometimes anti into the anterior chamber. But what they have reported is it's about 0.441% with uh, after intravitreal tramsinol. They've also reported these viral retinitis after sustained release implants like Ozodex or Fusinolone. And in about 76% of these patients, CMV is implicated as the cause. The duration when the mean time to develop retinitis is not known because possibly because of the lesser number of cases, 
But in this report, they say that it is up to three to four months after transplant, and with DEX implant, they say it is around one to one point five months. We know we uh, have also managed retinitis being developed after uh, even when the patient is immunosuppressed. Like example, post renal transplant. This is a patient who is after renal transplant with systemic immunosuppression, de developing a macular CMV retinitis following DEX implant with fake emulsification. He developed these symptoms two months after the procedure. But when I was looking at immunocompetence, are there any reports? There is one case report which was published in American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2021, where they reported a case of CMV retinitis following DEX implant. Here, the patient was a known case of Bet AMD. He, he had failed to show any improvement with anti -VEGFs. As a desperate measure, they gave him DEX implant. And after 10 weeks, he complained of floaters. And when, what they saw was a retinitis patch, CMV retinitis patch, which resolved well with treatment. By this all, we know that we knew that steroids are immunosuppressive agents. They are very strong immunosuppressive agents, but locally also they can cause enough immunosuppression to trigger CMV infection. See, we in our practice, as retina practice, we use DEX implants in many of the conditions where we are not getting a good response to the conventional treatment or as a primary choice in pseudophytic CME or as uveitic uh, cataracts as a cover, local steroid cover. But what we should remember is the altered local immunity caused by these can trigger reactivation of fulminant latent infections like CMV, ARN, and toxoplasmosis. And the risk is amplified in immunosuppressed individuals. In immunocompetent also remember that specific prophylaxis against these agents is impossible. Hence, it becomes very important in case selection, which becomes very much significant. So at this point, this is the latest follow-up when I saw him one week back. He had come with a slight blurring of vision in the left eye. Vision had dropped to 2 by 60. There was one plus cells in the AC. There's a mild vitreous haze. Luckily for me, the retinitis didn't show any paradoxical worsening. It continued to show resolution. However, on OCT, there was a recurrence of macular edema with the increase in parafoveal spongy spaces. So I have continued him on oral valerganacyclovir 450 milligram twice a day. I have given him intravitreal ranibzumab this time for the recurrent macular edema. And the cells, mild cells and mild vitreous haze may be because of local immune recovery, which I have not done anything very aggressive now. So what I learned from this case is we know that viral retinitis can happen in immunocompetence also. The time frame we don't know. We have to keep observing. And the most common organism is CMV retinitis in almost 73%. And the most patients develop either a solitary patch of retinitis, either in the posterior pole or in the periphery. The learning point here is we should see the entire fundus every visit, even if you are seeing monthly, see the entire periphery, especially those who are recovering, uh, recurring, uh, taking multiple injections of steroids. Hence the title, with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Manjula, for a, uh, for a wonderful case. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, um, local steroids, again, our practice has increased of local steroid implantation and one needs to be very, very careful when we are using these drugs as well. My, uh, I would just like to ask a question to you. I mean, contrast to, I mean, I do agree with you. We do see a lot of these cases with intravitreal tricots and with the DEXA, it's far lesser. But of course, we do see in DEXA as well, implants. My only uh, question to you was, actually, you had a wonderful response with such limited number of injections. At least in my practice, for these kind of which are non-HIV uh, yes, related, uh, you know, CMV retinitis, I have had to really struggle with multiple. So normally we get over with um, CMV retinitis in a HIV, we get a very early response. Whereas in yes, a non-HIV like your case, uh, I we need a lot of injections to give. I would just like to ask um, Dr. Um, Dwani and Dr. Vinay also because we are we are surgeons as well. Uh, in this particular case, would it have made any sense to remove the implant? I mean, in your case, he, of course, did very well. But in case, because generally this is a little more non-refractory, uh, you know, this kind of CMV uh, thing. So yes, there I we are. Thought, yeah. I yeah, thought sorry. I will uh, observe for one month and then take a call. I have given eight injections, madam, in two months. Yeah, but uh, it luckily even lot more. So that's yes. what I'm yeah, luckily, uh, HIV, yeah, usually yeah. these take a longer time to settle down. And also what we have seen in our practice is they have a lot of uh, vasculopathy. 
So there are a lot of uh, ischemia. There is a lot of, so these guys uh, progress to neovascularization very quickly. So generally they need to be lasered once the retinitis settles down. I would like to ask the panel um, and the retinal surgeons predominantly who are there in this group, uh, what their experiences with dealing with these uh, cases as well. But very well managed case, Manjula. Very nice. Thank you, madam. Thanks a lot. Um, ma'am, actually, um, I think uh, Positex implant will be an additional procedure. And sometimes when you go inside, they may induce breaks also. So I would not jump in and uh, do a surgery in such cases. As Madam has rightly done, I would still wait for the response. If at all it is worsening or if it is sight threatening, then I would go in and remove the implant. Or else, uh, uh, there are chances that uh, we may induce a break because it is an uh, inflamed retina. Uh, because uh, yeah, in a form vitreous, we need to induce the PVD sometimes uh, to remove the ozotex. If you just pluck it, then it may induce the break. So I would still wait and watch like what Madam has done. The only question I wanted to ask Dr. Manjula again was uh, uh, valgancyclovir is associated with a lot of toxicity as well. So in a 76-year-old, I think, is your patient. No? Um, 78. 78. Um, how often would you look out, I mean, monitor the blood parameters in this uh, because of the every age and the... Yeah, yeah every two weeks, ma'am. But uh, why I was very hesitant to start uh, systemic since he is out outstation patient and uh, one, once I given the induction phase, I would like to call him weekly once. I was scared that the implant being there, should I have to step up the antivirals? This was the only thing which was running in my mind at that time. So in, still I was giving weekly, I was more confident. Weekly twice, I was more confident. But once I switched on to maintenance, I had two options, either to continue weekly twice injections or weekly once with systemic. Uh, but uh, luckily, he is not a diabetic. His all uh, serum creatinine, LFT, everything is normal at baseline. I've started him just one month. I have given oral uh, valagancyclovir. Now, I, when I see him, I will stop that also because the retinitis has shown improvement. The primary pathology has come back. For that, I have given anti vegf so that I need not have to rush into laser till the haze completely goes down. I wanted to ask you one more, madam. How do you uh, tackle this local immune recovery because the implant is not working now. It is three months post implant. He has developed cells and haze. Do you start systemic steroids or do you wait for the local immune recovery to come, come down? Basically for CMD retinitis, we don't use the systemic steroids like other AR and kind of a thing. Uh, if you have immune recovery of reactors with vitritis, they do well with the topical steroids, such as diphoropredinate that has a posterior segment penetration, reduces the macular edema, provided that the intraocular pressure is maintained within normal limits. But otherwise, these patients have the tendency for the pressure to go up. One more thing I would like to ask is, this particular patient uh, um, have refractory macular edema with recurrence with so many OCDEX injection. I would like to look in to revisit the cause. What was the loss uh, cause for the vision loss in the right eye? One. And the second thing, this, this patient in addition to uh, autoimmune, the infective worker, uh, uh, what was the serum homocysteine level? Um, uh, the right eye loss is because of uh, trauma. Even mm -hmm. when uh, it, this case was given to me, I was worried about what type of retinitis it is. Even though clinically it looked like CMV, ARN was unlikely. However, the other eye is traumatic and it is pre -thysical. It is quiet. It is not causing any watering or redness or photophobia. Second one, I have uh, not investigated to homocysteine per se because uh, he's 78 years. Do you, if you say, I will definitely investigate for homocysteine. See, so what are the cases, few cases we have seen when they have a refractory course with so many OCDEX injection, when they're coming back with that and we have seen the, in addition to that, the vasculopathy causes uh, also can be there. And in that situation, so additional folic acid will help the patient to recover. I, I do agree the age is not in favor, but especially when the patient comes back with refractory macular edema secondary to CRVO, I think it's worthwhile to look into additional systemic hematological parameters in this case. Sure. Very well managed. It's such a complicated one after develop the viral retinitis and it's a tough decision whether to retain or to remove. So that one. Thank you, madam. Thanks yes. a lot. Looking into the root cause analysis, I was just wondering.
it may not have association, but better to check it out the possible causes. Surely, ma'am, I look into it. Thank you, Dr. Manjula. You. May I request uh, Dr. Vinay, um, Dr. Vinay, to present his case. Uh, Dr. Vinay is uh, a Vitro Retina consultant from Vitala Institute of Ophthalmology. And uh, can we have his presentation, please? Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank Karnataka Ophthalmic Society for the opportunity. Today, I'll be presenting a curious case of corridor nodule. A 35-year-old male presented to us with sudden diminution of vision in left eye since four days. And uh, he had no systemic illness. And uh, best corrected visual acuity in right eye was 6 by 6 and left eye was 6 by 9. Right eye anterior segment examination was normal. Posterior segment showed few yellowish subretinal deposits, like which was resembling crusins. And left eye had subretinal fluid at the macula with multiple subretinal yellowish lesions. Initially, we thought these yellowish lesions could be either fibrin associated with CSCR or it could be a coronal granuloma. Uh, here, uh, we can note that uh, there is subretinal fluid at the macula and subretinal alloys deposits can be seen superior and inferior to the fovea in left eye and there were few drusen-like deposits in the right eye. Fundus autofluorescence showed hyper-autofluorescence in both right eye and left eye except for few areas of hyper-autofluorescence. OCT over the macula showed subretinal fluid at the macula and a focal corridor elevation superior to the macula. OCT over the uh, alloy subretinal lesion showed focal corridor elevation with the granuloma-like lesion with irregularities in the retinal pigment epithelium and hyperreflective dots in the outer retina associated with subretinal fluid. At the macula, we could see uh, subretinal fluid and O OCT over the lesion, which was inferior to the fovea, showed irregularities in the RPE, enlarged corridor vessel, along with localized subretinal fluid. Surprisingly, in the right eye also, over the uh, drusen-like deposits, we could see irregularities in the retinal pigment epithelium associated with localized subretinal fluid. There was no subretinal fluid at the fovea. So, considering all these findings, uh, systemic workup for uh, granulomatous uveitis was done and uh, HRCT chest showed pericardial effusion and urine showed albuminuria. And when we routinely checked blood pressure uh, before uh, FFA and ICG, uh, to our surprise, we uh, noted that the blood pressure was 230 by 120 millimeters of mercury. Immediately, the patient was started on antihypertensive medications and one week later, the blood pressure was 140 by 80. So we went back and uh, saw the uh, fundus photos. And actually, I had missed uh, the segmental arterial narrowing in the right eye along with AV crossing changes. And in left eye, there was gross AV crossing changes along with segmental arterial narrowing. And once the blood pressure had stabilized, uh, ICGA was done. ICGA along with fluorescein angiogram was done and ICGA showed gross corridor hypoperfusion. Here we can see gross corridor hypoperfusion on ICGA in initial phase. And even right eye showed corridor hypoperfusion. And with later stages of ICGA, there was uh, uh, extensive corridor vascular leakages noted both in right eye and left eye. Here we can see uh, corridor vascular leakage in the left eye and here in the right eye. And uh, uh, very late phases of ICGA showed a linear uh, streak like uh, hypersinescence uh, corresponding with the corridor vascular leakage. And uh, on follow up at one week uh, post reduction in blood pressure, the blood pressure was 142 by 80 and the yellowish subretinal lesion had disappeared and uh, the subret uh, subretinal fluid at the macula had completely resolved. And OCTA, OCT over the lesion showed a decrease in the corridor elevation, except for few irregularities in the retinal pigment epithelium and the minimal subretinal fluid. 
and the segmental arterial narrowing and av crossing changes had grossly decreased uh, this here uh, we can hardly trace the artery whereas uh, post reduction in blood pressure we can uh, prominently see the artery the same could be seen in the left eye where uh, segmental arterial narrowing was seen before uh, at presentation whereas uh, after the reduction in blood pressure uh, segmental arterial narrowing had decreased so highlights of this case are hypertension could be important non malignant uh, masquerade and focal choroidal elevation can be mistaken for granulomas in hypertension choroidopathy so identification of hypertension choroidopathy is crucial in such cases as we treat patients with choroidal granulomas with steroids which could be uh, actually detrimental in such cases and uh, it could worsen the condition and uh, points to differentiate from inflammation in our case was firstly absence of vitreous cells and uh, disc hyperemia presence of av crossing changes and segmental arterial narrowing absence of hypertransmission on oct which is usually seen in granulomas so in our case on oct we could not see any hypertransmission posterior to the lesion Ivernesi group in 2015 published an article which differentiated granulomas from large choroidal blood vessels, where they uh, noted that both in cases of large choroidal granulomas and uh, small choroidal granulomas, hypertransmission was seen posterior to the lesion, whereas large choroidal vessel appeared as homogeneous, hyperreflective, round-shaped structure resembling granulomatous lesion. Whereas there was no increased transmission effect underneath this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinay, for highlighting the importance of diagnosing hypertension as one of the differential diagnoses, which can mimic granulomas. Now, this case is open for the discussion. Yes. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Manjula, would you like to comment on this case? No, ma'am. I had similar experience, but it was bilateral. So easy for me to look into hypertension as the cause. Okay. Dr. Apurva uh, is also... Uh, Dwani is here. Yeah. Yes, Dwani. Uh, ma'am, actually, uh, this was uh, quite significant and we investigated and we understood it is a hypertensive choroidopathy. But actually, in our practice, uh, like people just come in for a general examination and if we look at the AV crossing changes, I have been diagnosing uh, blood pressure in patients like almost two to three new cases per day. So it's very important like whenever a person comes in for uh, uh, examination, we do, we should like if we have access to a blood um, automatic machine, it's a uh, simple just to do it in two minutes. And uh, otherwise, sometimes we feel like, okay, fine, you get it checked. And you know, that doesn't uh, like uh, translate well to the pain. They will, yeah, okay, fine. I don't have any symptoms. But these are the cases, like so many times I have diagnosed and sent them to the physician that your BP is really very high. So that was like, this is like a routine, like an automatic machine, not to go with the manual one, but uh, it should be done as a routine because it, we see some changes in the eye which others may not see. That is very true, actually. Um, so I think that's a very important point taken, and I think it corroborates very well with uh, the previous lecture by Dr. Rohan as well on non-malignant masquerades. So uh, hypertension is something which is definitely uh, more common, and I think an ophthalmologist will, it is, I mean, can pick it up much earlier. So I think your points are very well taken, Dr. Dwani, Dr. Manjula, and Dr. Benin. Uh, Dr. Apurva is also here. Would, uh, do you want to comment, Dr. Apurva, on this case on the imaging? I'm not sure if... Uh, yeah. Ma'am, I'm in the middle of something. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll probably comment later. Okay, sure. Uh, Padma... Uh, yeah. Apologies. So basically, like, you know, this eye access a window for us to diagnose hypertension, especially the patient is 35. And most of the times they can be having Adeline systemic disease. This particular patient presented with pericardial effusion and albuminuria. What was the systemic workup results for the cause for the hypertension, Dr. Vinay, in this case? I'm actually, physician had 
the extensively worked up for the cause of hypertension uh, later on when i proved actually he had a family history wherein uh, four to five of his uncles had uh, sudden cardiac arrest or uh, history of cva uh, but they could not find any uh, suprarenal cause or something like that yeah many times they have underlying systemic like you know renal pathology or uh, cardiac related issues or autoimmune disease that could be the reason for the hypertension that needs a t type workup and like i think in this uh, one point like, i would like uh, the transmission hyperfluorescence is important to differentiate between the parietal vessels and the granuloma in case of uveitis we can have associated posterior vitreous cells the retinal changes srf will be there even in the granuloma we can differentiate whether it could be tuberculosis or sarcoidosis the sarcoid have predominantly homogeneous in as structure with promptly satellite layer involvement whereas in tb we get a full thickness involvement with a lobulated and heterogeneous echo in that way we can differentiate between different types of granulomas and also the choroidopathy in addition to that we also get structures like a helsnik spots on the rpe changes in, in hypertensive changes basically they have a extensive choroidal ischemia which shows as nicely seen in your icg images as a non perfusion ma'am how often do you see choroidal elevation such kind of choroidal elevation in hypertensive choroidopathy <coughs> there can be there are reports of peds and uh, the pigment epithelial uh, irregularities but how often do you see a focal choroidal elevation like this and also it's associated with you have seen low uh, exudative detachment it's seen it depends upon the severity of the disease i think the pathology is, is the uh, focal choroidal ischemia so because of yes. the focal choroidal ischemia the rpe overlying is also affected and probably that is the reason why you are also seeing and maybe also dilated vessels alongside the choroidal ves vasculature is dilated maybe you know so there are multiple factors probably which could have you know because focal choroidopathies are uh, described in uh, malignant hypertension as well so i think in this case maybe it's a combo of multiple factors which could have caused those kind of choroidal elevations but it's a very interesting case i mean we've learned a lot <laughs> through this case but what i would also like to highlight for an ophthalmologist is a basic urine routine gives you a lot of information and i think we picked up quite a bit based on the albumin urea which was there uh, and then because normally you do not see otherwise you know uh, and uh, that is something which should strike even simple tests lab tests will give a lot of uh, clue So Padma, we'll move on to the uh, next case. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. Case. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vinay, for the well Thank documented you. and highlighting the important step not to miss the fundus findings and urine examination in a practice. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Dr. Ankush Kavali. He's a senior urinary consultant at Narayan Ekalaya. He'll be presenting to a case of an infection in non-infectious kilo urinitis. Over to Dr. Ankush. I'll be presenting a case of uh, infection in non-infectious scleroubiitis. So my case, a 64-year-old male, uh, presented with complaints of blurring of vision in the right eye and pain since past 20 days. Uh, he was he has shown elsewhere, and the diagnosis of bilateral posterior ubiitis or posterior scleritis was made. The patient is hypertensive and diabetic on treatment. He is also a known case of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and he is on HCQ as well as methotrexate 15 mg. He has first seen a neuro ophthalmologist who suspected autoimmune optic neuropathy or old optic neuritis, and uh, had done the visual fields, which showed in the right eye advanced field loss and left eye peripheral defects. The VEP showed bilateral optic now demyelination, right more than left. Since the patient is a known case of uh, posterior uveitis or curare posterior scleritis, he was referred to uh, uvea department. My colleagues have seen earlier. Uh, the presenting visual acuity is one by sixteen in the right eye, six twelve in the left eye. In the right eye, the patient has got scleral thinning, and the fundus shows peripapillary swelling and tessellated background, and the B scan shows thickening of posterior sclera. 
see crp is quite elevated the one two is also positive and the an is also positive as well as the patient's r factor is also positive uh, so with this uh, the diagnosis of active sclerosis was met and the dose of methotrexate was increased a lefolamide was added and omnacortil was started and the rheumatologist also started alendronate and that's a biphosphonate so here it is important to note that the patient is on also on alendronate that's a biphosphonate which in turn can cause sclerosis but in our case it's a unilateral sclerosis what the patient had so follow up after a month the fundus shows peripapillary swelling has reduced but after two months the patient comes with the relapse of scleritis with mild anti uveitis methotrexate was reduced that time because of leukopenia and probably because of that the patient had relapse the patient was again started on topical steroids in sides uh, mmf was started and treatment was started with 32 mg the relapse resolved but again after 3 months there has there is another relapse and this time it was quite severe again steroids iv steroids and the patient was finally started on cyclophosphamide now here i have gone to the patient the patient came to me after taking covid vaccine and within 4 days of that the patient develops herpes zoster ophthalmicus in the right eye which worsened the sclero uveitis the steroids uh, the oral steroids were tapered and uh, valsivir was added the immunomodulator therapy was withheld and after resolution of the herpes zoster as well as the patient's sclero uveitis the fundus was looking like this so if you can compare the previous fundus picture with this one you will see those new lesions which has appeared here which are probably the coronal granulomas or what we call it them as coronal vitiligo in uh, herpes zoster sclerokeratitis so after resolution of that since we have stopped the uh, immunosuppressive therapy the patient had relapse but this time in the left eye for the first time which was a sclerokeratitis then again the indoxan was resumed and the maintenance dose of valsivir was continued now the problem here is the patient has got infection which is herpes zoster because of that the patient has got scleritis and the patient also has got background bilateral autoimmune sclero uh, uveitis so this is a challenging case so we don't know whether to stop the valsivir in this case or whether to stop at all how long to continue and how many recurrences patient is going to get of herpes zoster we don't know Uh, recently, I have seen one case in which the patient is on biologics. The patient had herpes zoster, but not in the eye, but on the his right leg. And the dermatologist has stopped all the antivirals, and the patient is doing well. The patient is on infliximab, which he took uh, multiple injections, and in his case, the herpes zoster is not reactivating. But in our case, when the patient has got herpes zoster in the right eye, patient is on immunomod uh, immunosuppression. Uh, we really don't know whether to stop the valsivir completely or to continue for many many months thank you thank you dr ankush for presenting that most challenging case yeah now this case is open for discussion thank you dr ankush very interesting case and i and i mean i totally agree with you these cases are a nightmare to manage uh my question was uh, you were showing this you know choroidal granuloma so was this patient also having a scleral component along i mean posterior scleral component or was it just a scleral uveitis um, i mean i that part i just didn't get it in terms of dr ankush can you unmute yourself and answer it was definitely an interesting case but probably what we we do in our cases are um for me the take home in this particular thing was those choroidal depigmentary alterations which she was seeing i mean uh, that is something which i don't think i have noticed or maybe i should start noticing uh, in our cases the only other thing which probably i would like to keep is these patients who are on immunomodulators for um, the systemic disease it is definitely a challenge in terms of infections and we do give prophylactic antiviral Uh, for a very long period of time again it varies either we can give weekly prophylaxis biweekly prophylaxis 
I mean, I think it is basically a, a case to case basis. Is this Dr. Ankur, you can answer the second time when the patient had a coronal vitiligo at that point of time. Dr. Yeah. wanted to know was there is a scleral involvement as well. Was there a posterior scleritis complex? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It was a pan scleritis. The patient came with the anterior plus uh, uh, posterior scleritis. So patient okay. had a lot of pain. He came with a, a lit edema. The movements were restricted. And uh, after resolution of this scleritis, uh, when we examined the fundus, we discovered those uh, hypopigmented lesions in the inferior and temporal fundus, which we uh, call them as a or uh, my only question probably for you dr ankush is um see the in rheumatoid arthritis also we do get a pan scleritis involvement as well right. um so in those cases um you know is there any way to suspect uh that there could be a, because there are no other you can even get a sclero uveitis in a rheumatoid also so in yeah. your case my only thing is how will you differentiate like you know when do i start antiviral in this if so the, in, in my case it was the diagnosis was crystal clear because the patient had his job purpose was that he came with the unilateral forehead uh, skin rash okay. and at the same time he had scleritis so the history of uh, vaccination and following which after four days the patient developed purpose of typical skin rash and in addition to that uh, the scleritis so uh, the diagnosis at that time it was very clear that it's a purpose goes to induce a scleritis and not a reactivation of the old uh, uh, R-related uh, scleritis. The other thing what I also noticed in your presentation was there was an optic nerve swelling as well, right? Yeah, he was being diagnosed as optic neuritis by neurologist. Was uh, it uh, consequent to the purpose? Before coming to our hospital, so he was diagnosed elsewhere. So uh, we don't know about it. So when he came to us, it was a scleritis initially treated by uh, my colleagues. And then uh, after a few months, he got the vaccination, which uh, caused the herpes zoster infection and then the scleritis. And the beautiful part is after resolution of this, uh, uh, when the immunosuppressive agents were discontinued, uh, after a month or two months, he had other eye uh, sclerokeratitis, which was typical of uh, RA. The patient came with the sclerokeratitis. So that the patient had in the left eye peripheral uh, coronary infiltrates, uh, which were very typical of uh, RA induced uh, sclerokeratitis. And then the immunosuppressive agents were restarted. Okay. okay. So following post COVID infections, also the vaccination, we are seeing a lot of virus reactivation, herpetic group, especially the varicella zoster virus, presenting in the form of herpes zoster, anterior uveitis, and we have seen a couple of patients with acute retinal necrosis as well. So, which needs to be diag diagnosed and managed appropriately. And coming to the hypopigmented coronal lesions, recently, which we have reported in ocular immunology and inflammation, the herpes zoster patients, when they present and during the recovery, they do develop these hypopigmented lesions in the choroid. We call this as MXCL, that is multiple hypopigmented coronal lesions. These, they are just present. And when we do the either the ICG or the OCT, we are not able to pick it up. Only the fundus photograph picks up these lesions. We just observe this patient. If they have any associated involvement of intraocular signs, then we treat them with anti-inflammatory. Otherwise, these hypopigmented lesions per se does not require any treatment at present in our series. Yeah, they do not, uh, just one point I would like to add that although they do not require any treatment, the ICG in some cases uh, did pick up those hypo lesions and those hypo lesions were because of the uh, choroidal uh, scars. So when we did the OCT over the scars, the OCT was showing choroidal thinning. Whereas in some cases uh, it showed a uh, mild choroidal elevation, which again resolved. So I think uh, the article which we have published in that ICG was not done in all the cases. But uh, when, uh, the poster which we presented in USI with 10 cases, uh, many of those cases, they underwent the ICG and we uh, came to know that those lesions do show a hypo uh, on the ICG and when we do the OCG over those uh, lesions, it may either show the coronal thinning, which uh, suggests the coronal scarring, or it can also show mild coronal elevation. So, uh, although we coined a term uh, to describe this entity as a coronal vitiligo, later we uh, came to know that uh, there is a mild reactivation in the form of coronal elevation or coronal scarring. 
for this reason. It's very informative, a very, very interesting mm -hmm. case and a very diagnostic challenge, I must say. You've handled it very well. Uh, very, very nice. Thank you. So uh, with this, I think we will end the session one and then we will move on to the session two. Um, I thank all the speakers in the session one.